Please stay tuned after this video for a preview from our latest video from our new channel, Paranormally Listed. The video is about killers who are haunted by the spirits of their victims. Before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our fantastic sponsor, Babbel. Are you still looking for that great last minute gift? Don't give them a sweater they won't wear or a book they won't read. You should get them a subscription from Babbel so they can learn a new language. Just imagine what learning a new language could do for someone. You could get them an awesome new job or a great promotion. Or what if they're inspired to travel so they can use their new language skills and they meet that someone special. They could settle down, get married, and have children. And all that would be because of you and your thoughtful gift. Okay, so while that may not happen, learning a new language with Babbel is fun and rewarding. Over the past year, I've been using Babbel to learn how to speak Dutch. Ignat de my letterlands net perfectis, maar ik blijf learn met Babbel. If you're looking for a great New Year's resolution, why not try learning a new language with Babbel? Babbel teaches you language you use for the real world. They also have multiple ways to learn, so it's always fun. This includes podcasts, games, videos, and even classes with top teachers. It's also not time consuming, so anyone could do it. They are just 10 minute interactive lessons. You should check out Babbel because it would make an amazing thoughtful gift, or you should check it out if you want to learn a new language for yourself. Right now, they have a special deal for criminally listed viewers. Get 65% off your subscription. Just click on the link below this video. So please check out Babbel today because you'll be helped supporting criminally listed. Number three, Perez Ross. On September 12, 2021, around 9 p.m., a man, who was only identified as Al M, was waiting for a bus in St. Louis, Missouri. Suddenly, a man walked up to him and shot him multiple times with a 40 caliber handgun. Al M was taken to the hospital. He survived, but he was left disabled. About 24 hours later, about half a mile away, there was another shooting. 16-year-old Marnay Haynes was found dead on the side of the road. She had been shot once in the arm and once in the head with a 40 caliber handgun. Three days later, on September 16, 2021, at 10.23 p.m., the police were called to a gas station in St. Louis. A woman, only identified as our age, had been shot in the face. She was conscious when the police arrived, but she couldn't talk because of her injury. She was taken to the hospital, and eventually, she had to go into intensive care. But our age survived her horrifying injury. The police followed a trail of blood, and they found a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson cartridge. This shooting happened about 8 miles from where Marnay Haynes was killed. There was another shooting just over a half an hour later, about half a mile away from where R.H. was shot. 49-year-old Pamela Abercrombie was walking back from the convenience store when she was shot. She was rushed to the hospital, but tragically, she died. A 40 caliber Smith & Wesson cartridge was found near her body. Three days later, around noon on September 19, 2021, the body of 24-year-old Carrie Ross was found in a vacant lot in St. Louis. He had been shot in the head and the body. It's believed that he was killed the night before. St. Louis has a gunshot detection system called ShotSpotter. ShotSpotter registered two gunshots at 11.52 p.m. on September 18th, which is about 12 hours before the body was found. Near the body, another 40 caliber Smith & Wesson cartridge was found. A week later, on September 26, at 7.15 a.m., ShotSpotter detected two gunshots. The police went to the area, which is close to where the first two shootings happened. They found the dead body of 40-year-old Lester Robinson. Robinson had been shot in the hand and the head. Once again, a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson cartridge was found. Then, the shooting suddenly stopped. In two weeks, four people were killed and two were seriously injured. The people of St. Louis were hoping that the killer had been arrested for a different crime or they possibly died. But tragically, neither of those things had happened. 
On November 1, 2021, the police were called to an apartment building in Kansas City, Kansas. 35-year-old Damian Irvin was found shot to death in his apartment. The apartment surveillance footage was reviewed. Irvin was seen entering the building with a man three days earlier on October 28th. Then the man left on his own. The man Irvin was with had the distinctive crescent moon tattoo between his eyes. More of the footage was reviewed and on October 29th, the day after it's believed Irvin was shot, the man with the tattoo came into the apartment building again. This time he was with another resident of the building, 25 year old Radaja Faro. The man of Faro went into her apartment. Fifteen minutes later, the man walked out of the building alone. On November 2nd, the day after Irvin's body was found, the police checked Faro's apartment. They found her nude, dead body. She had been shot to death. It turned out when the man entered the apartment building with Faro, he had showed his license to a security guard. The police learned that he was 25-year-old Perez Reed. The FBI was involved in the investigation at this point. The investigators learned on October 28th, the day Irvin was killed, Reed traveled from St. Louis to Kansas City. The FBI also learned that Reed had purchased a ticket to go back to St. Louis. On November 5th, FBI agents trailed Reed. He ended up getting off the train in Independence, Missouri, where he boarded a bus. Reed was arrested on the bus. In his possession, they found a 40 caliber handgun. Reed, who grew up in Ferguson, Missouri, had a history of mental illness. He was born to parents whose social services considered unfit. When he was born, his mother was 17 and his father was 30. When Reed was 9, he and his brother were placed in the custody of his cousin. But it does not appear that his cousin cared for them because she did not do anything that the courts mandated. But no one with the courts or social services ever followed up with her. Five years before the murders, when Reed was 20, he tried to set a car on fire. A month later, he got into a fight with one of his cousins. He set his cousin's house on fire while four family members were inside of it, and they drove off in his family's car. Reed was arrested for arson, and at the time, his family wanted to prosecute him. Had Reed been convicted of arson, he would have been sentenced to 5 to 15 years in prison. But then his family changed their minds and the charges against him were dropped. After Reed was arrested in Independence, he was charged with six counts of murder. He pleaded not guilty to all charges and he claims he has never hurt anyone. No trial date has been set. Number 2. Paul Apodaca In the summer of 1988, 21-year-old Althea Oakley was a student at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She grew up in Taos, New Mexico. On June 22, 1988, Oakley, her brother, and her boyfriend were at a party at a fraternity in Albuquerque. Oakley got into a fight with her boyfriend and she decided to walk home alone. Around 8.30 p.m., as she was walking, she was attacked by a man who stabbed her multiple times. Her screams drew the attention of people in the neighborhood. 911 was called and Oakley was taken to the hospital. But tragically, nothing can be done for the 21-year-old woman and she died shortly after arriving at the hospital. A man was seen running away from the area. He was described as a Hispanic man between the ages of 22 and 24. He was between 5'7 and 5'9 and he weighed around 140 pounds. The police searched the area where the attack happened. In a storm drain, they found a unique watch with the movements of the sun and the moon. It did not belong to Oakley, but the police decided to keep it as evidence. Unfortunately, no arrests were made in the case. 
Several months went by. Early on the morning of September 9th, 1988, 13-year-old Stella Gonzalez and a friend were walking home in Albuquerque. Three men in a car confronted them. Then two gunshots shattered the quiet of the night. Stella was shot in the back of the head. She was rushed to the hospital, and for a while, she remained in critical condition. But tragically, she died in the hospital. It wasn't long before her case went cold. The police had no reason to suspect that the two cases were connected. Over a year later, on July 16, 1989, 18-year-old Kaylin Arquette was driving home in Albuquerque. Arquette's mother, Lois Duncan, was a notable author best known for her young adult books. She mostly wrote in the horror genre. Her most popular books were Hotel for Dogs, Killing Mr. Griffith, Summer of Fear, and I Know What You Did Last Summer. All four books were adapted into films. Around 10.30 p.m., her cat was stopped at a red light when she was shot twice in the head. Her car then drifted into three lanes of oncoming traffic before it crashed into a pole. 18-year-old Kaylin Arquette was pronounced dead at the hospital. When the police arrived on the scene, they saw a primer gray Volkswagen parked near the shooting. Half a year later, three men were arrested for the murder. A witness said that the three men had shot her on a dare. But then it was determined that the witness was lying. So 10 days after the arrest, the charges against all three men were dropped. After that, the case seemingly became hopelessly cold. The police did not realize that the three murders were connected. The murder of her daughter haunted Lois Duncan. She wrote two books about the murder, 1992's Who Killed My Daughter and Went to the Wolves, which was published in 2013. Tragically, Duncan died in 2016 at the age of 82 without finding out who killed her daughter. 32 years after Kaylin Arquette's murder, in July 2021, the police arrested a 53-year-old man named Paul Apodaca for a parole violation. Apodaca had a long criminal history. He had served time in prison for rape, kidnapping, aggravated battery, and battery on a peace officer. In 1995, Abadaka was convicted of raping his 14-year-old stepsister and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. In summer 2021, Abadaka was on probation for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. He was homeless and he was supposed to be staying at a homeless shelter as part of his probation. But when he didn't report to the homeless shelter, he was arrested. It's unclear if he was being questioned but suddenly, he started confessing. He said that in the 1980s and 1990s, he committed several murders and rapes. He confessed to the murder of 21-year-old Althea Oakley. He said he was working as a security guard less than a mile from where she was murdered. He said he was driving and he came across Oakley as she was walking alone. He drove behind her and he planned on kidnapping her at knife point and then raping her. He pulled ahead of her and parked his car. Abadaka said that he thought that there might be a struggle, so he removed his watch. He said that the watch tracked the movements of the sun and the moon. He threw the watch into a storm drain. He said they walked up to Oakley and she smiled at him and said hi. Abadaka told the police, that's the worst part, that's the worst part. I heard someone that smiled at me. He then stabbed her multiple times. Abadaka explained, I think what made me do it, what made me attack her was all, all the hatred I had for women. Because growing up, I had seen men treating women bad, and they, they go for the bad guys. I tried to be nice and be good, and they just didn't want that. So I was jealous and, and had hatred, and I just released it. Abadaka also confessed to the murder of Kaylin Arquette. 
When the police arrived at the scene of the shooting, they noted that there was a Volkswagen Beetle parked nearby. The driver of the Beetle was Paul Apodaca. The police collected his information, but he was never interviewed, even though he had an extensive criminal record. Finally, Apodaca confessed to the murder of Stella Gonzalez. Details of that confession were not made public. After three decades, the police believe that they have finally found the killer of the three women. At the time of this recording, Paul Abadaka has only been charged with the murder of Athea Oakley, but it's expected that more charges are coming. The police have also said that Apodaca may have committed more murders. 53-year-old Paul Apodaca is currently being held at the Lee County Correctional Facility in Hobbs, New Mexico. No trial date has been set. Number 1. Francois Revove On April 8, 1986, an eight-year-old girl named Sarah was leaving her family's apartment in Paris, France. In the elevator of her building, she was confronted by a man who said he was a police officer. He took her into the basement of her building where he raped her. He then strangled her. The girl survived and the assault was reported to the police. Three days later, a man was riding in an elevator in a different building with a girl only identified as Natalie. He pulled her out of the elevator and dragged her into the stairwell. He attempted to sexually assault her, but the sound of footsteps startled him, so he let her go. A month later, on May 5, 1986, 11-year-old Cecile Block left her family's apartment to go to school. At lunch, her mother called home, but no one answered. She called Cecile's school and learned that she did not attend classes that morning. The security guard at their building was alerted and he looked around the building. In the basement, under an old piece of carpet, was the partially nude body of 11-year-old Cecile Block. She had been raped, strangled, and stabbed in the chest. The police talked to Cecile's half-brother, Luke Richard. He remembered encountering a strange man in the elevator. He said that the man seemed very sure of himself and he was too polite. When they parted ways, the man said, have a very, very good day. Luke described the man to a sketch artist. He said that the most notable feature of the man was that he had acne scars on his face. The killer became known as Le Gorilla, or the pockmarked man. Unfortunately, the police had no promising suspects. Well, the police thought that the attacks and the murder of Cecile were all committed by the same man but they didn't find any likely suspects. In 1992, the case was closed without an arrest being made. Four years later, in 1996, the case was reopened so that semen collected from Cecile's body could be submitted for DNA testing. It turned out that the DNA did not reveal the killer's identity, but it did link him to many more serious crimes. Over the years after the DNA match, even more crimes have been attributed to him. The first of these crimes happened over a month after Cecile's murder. On April 1st, 1987, a 14-year-old boy named Cyril was having a party in the apartment he shared with his mother and stepfather. His mother and stepfather were away for the evening. About a dozen teenagers were at the party. A man who said he was with the Jadamari which is a military force that does law enforcement in the civilian population, called through the intercom. He said he was there because of noise complaints. Once he was in the apartment, he kicked out the other kids, but made Cyril and his 14-year-old girlfriend, Jennifer, stay behind. Once the other kids were gone, he tied Cyril to his mother and stepfather's bed. He tied Jennifer to Cyril's bed. He attempted to sexually assault Jennifer, but she fought him off. Cyril was able to free himself, and when the man came back into the room, he smashed him in the face with a clock. Cyril then went into his bedroom and freed Jennifer. They fled the apartment. 
On April 29, 1987, 38-year-old Chios Politi was found dead in his bed by his wife. Politi worked as an overnight mechanic for Air France. When he was found, he was naked and he had been tied to the bed. He had been tortured by being burned with lit cigarettes. Finally, he was strangled to death with a garrote. In another bedroom was the dead body of the family's German au pair, 21-year-old Ermgard Mueller. She had also been tied to the bed and tortured with a lit cigarette. In addition to that, she had been sexually assaulted. Finally, her throat had been slit. Less than two weeks later, a man knocked on the door of a 26-year-old woman identified as Andrea S. The man said he was a police officer and he was investigating a report of strange noises. Andrea didn't doubt that the man was a police officer. He had a walkie-talkie and a gun. Suddenly, he pushed her into her apartment. He pulled out the gun and tied her up. He then sexually assaulted her. When he was done, he left the apartment. Andrea was able to free herself and she called the police. Four months later, on September 2nd, 1987, a 34 year old school teacher named Sylvia was selling a cabinet. A man came to her apartment saying he wanted to look at the cabinet. When he was in her apartment, he pulled out a gun equipped with a silencer. He forced her into the bedroom where he tied her up and then raped her. He left her alive. A month and a half later, on October 20th, 1987, a man identifying himself as a police officer knocked on the door of a 29-year-old editor for a fashion magazine named Lori. At the time, Lori had a friend over and her friend had her 18-month-old baby with her. He tied up both women. He stole some items but left the women and baby unharmed. A week later, on October 27, 1987, a 14-year-old girl identified only as Marianne left her school to go home for lunch. In a common area of her building, she encountered a man who followed her to the elevator. The man told Marianne that he was a police officer. Marianne was both a citizen of Brazil and France, and the man asked to see her identity papers. She told him she didn't have them on her, so they went to her apartment. In the apartment, the man pulled out a gun. He bound her and raped her. He stole some items and then left the apartment. On November 26, 1987, four women living in the same area said that they were harassed by a young man who claimed he was a police officer. He tried to get into their apartments, but all four women were able to get in and keep the man away from them. On November 30, 1987, the same man tried to kidnap a 25-year-old woman. He thought he was following her into her apartment, but the woman actually entered a photo lab that had several people in it. When he saw the other people, he left. Just 15 minutes later, he confronted two boys, one who was 14 and another who was 13. He said he was investigating runaways and he wanted to see their identification. The boys didn't have any, so he ordered them to take him to their home. The boys did as they were ordered. Once they were at one of their homes, he tied up the boys and stole several items. He left them physically unharmed. A week later, he encountered an eight-year-old girl in the common area of her apartment building. He told her he was a police officer and he asked to see her papers. He took her to the stairwell and hugged her tightly. The man kept hearing footsteps, so he left her in the stairwell and made his way out of the building. After that, the pockmarked man went quiet. No one was sure why he stopped, but the people of Paris were happy that he did. Nearly three years later, some people believe that he re-emerged. On January 30th, 1991, a 11 year old girl was raped in the elevator of her apartment building. She was shown sketches of several different men. 
She picked out the sketch of the pockmarked man and said that he was the one who attacked her. On December 4, 1991, 23-year-old Sophie Narm, an intern at a real estate company, was supposed to show a man in an apartment. The next day, her dead body was found in the apartment. She had been bound and raped. She was then strangled to death. It is believed that the pockmarked man committed the murder, but genetic evidence was lost, so it couldn't be definitively linked to him. But the investigators believe that she was his fifth murder victim. However, not everyone is convinced he committed the last two crimes. Instead, they think he took a seven-year break. What many people do agree upon is that he probably struck up his old habits in September 1994. On June 9, 1994, 19-year-old Corrine Leroy left for school. Tragically, she never made it to school. She was reported missing that night. On June 12, 1994, 33 days after she went missing, her body was found in a wooded area just over 6 miles from her home. She was fully clothed. She had been strangled to death with a garage, which is how Gilles Politi was killed. However, no genetic evidence connects her murder with the other murders. Three days after Kareen went missing, an 11 year old girl named Ingrid was playing in the small town of Mitri Mori, which is about 24 miles from downtown Paris. A man approached her and said he was a police officer. He put handcuffs on her wrist and he placed her in the back of his car. He took her to an abandoned house where he sexually assaulted her. He left her in the house and vanished. Once again, the genetic evidence was lost, so the police could not definitively link the attack to the pockmarked man, but elements of the crime, like the man claiming to be a police officer, made people think it was the work of the pockmarked man. If it was, it was the last known attack by the man. The case went cold again. Then, in 2021, 27 years after the last known attack, the case was reopened. The police concluded that based on witness accounts, the killer was most likely a member of the gendarmerie. At the time, there were 750 gendarmes stationed in Paris. On September 24th, a letter was sent to all the gendarmes who were still alive, asking for a sample of their DNA within five days. On September 27th, a woman whose husband received the letter reported him missing. He was 59-year-old father of two, Francois Revove. Revove had been a member of the Gendarmerie, but he later became a police officer. He had since retired. Two days after he was reported missing, he was found at a seaside resort near Mount Pallier in the south of France. He had died from a drug overdose. He wrote a suicide note in which he didn't leave any specific details, but he does confess to being the pockmarked man. He wrote, I confess to being a great criminal who committed unforgivable acts until the end of the 1990s. He explained he had previous impulses, but he had got himself together. He also wrote that after 1997, he had done nothing. A sample of his DNA was taken. It was compared to the pockmarked man's DNA. It was a match. Over 35 years after the first murder, the police considered the case closed. The police said it was a bittersweet ending to the case. They were happy he was identified, but there are a lot of unanswered questions. The police said they will probably never know how many people he raped and murdered. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Now here's a clip from our video, Three Killers Haunted by Their Victims, from our new channel, Paranormally Listed. The last time April's parents saw her, she was riding her bike. About 20 minutes later, April's mother, Coral, went out to bring her home. But she couldn't find April. Coral immediately called 999, which is the emergency line in Great Britain. Officers were in the area in minutes. 
One girl said that she saw April talking to a man and then she got into his gray van. One notable thing that the girl said was that April got into the right side of the car. This is unusual because in most vehicles in the United Kingdom, the driver's side is on the right hand side. She also described the man by saying he had brown hair, a beard, and blue or green eyes. He was wearing a green jacket or a jumper, jeans, and running shoes. Massive searches were conducted for April. You can watch the rest of the video by clicking on the link on the screen now. You can also find a link to the channel in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.